Hi there, I'm Kyle Kittleson, the host of Med Circle. If this is the first video you've seen from us for in, in a while, then uh, go back because we have been posting and doing live streams all for Mental Health Month uh, all week. So there is a lot of content for you to catch up on. We are going to be doing a full 90 minutes today with four amazing doctors, Dr. Ish Major, who's joined me right now, Dr. Judy Ho, who will be here in just a moment, and then Dr. Dominic Sportelli and Dr. Romney will be joining us in the second half. For Mental Health Month, Med Circle is doing something that Med Circle has never done, which is allow anybody who wants it an entire month of Med Circle at no cost, no risk. You can access our entire video streaming library. You get guaranteed seats to all of our live classes. You get all of the live class recordings, which at this point, I can't even imagine how many those are. And you get all of the features unlocked in the Med Circle app, all for one, two, three, zero dollars. It's a complete month for you to jumpstart your mental health education, whether it's for yourself or somebody else. So make sure you take advantage of that while it lasts on May 31st at 11.59 p.m. That is going away. So make sure you claim that now while it is still available. Dr. Ish Major is back with us for uh, his second or third appearance on Med Circle. Dr. Ish, I reference your live class that we did on relationships many times in my personal <laughs> life and on Med Circle. I am so amped that you are back with us. It was a good time, man. Thanks so much for having me back, brother. Absolutely. Well, enough about me and enough about you too, Dr. Ash. We are going to go right into some uh, questions yep. from our uh, Med Circle members and viewers. While Mandy yep. pulls up our first question, if you're watching this on YouTube, an easy thing you can do to jumpstart your mental health education is to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Um, okay, so do we have a question from our first Med Circle member or viewer? If not, that's okay, because I have lots of questions for Dr. Ish as well. Um, and thank you to the person who just said, it is so worth the membership. I love, love, love Med Circle. Thank you. We love, love, love that you love it. Yeah. All right, here is our first question coming up with a screen share. And prior to this, we did have a couple technical difficulties. So I applaud all of the team that's working. I get to be cool on camera and act like, yeah, they'll fix it. They have to go figure out all of this uh, tech nonsense, which I cannot do. There we go. Med Circle member asked Dr. Ish, my family is hardworking, college educated, and pretty functional, but we all have trouble maintaining romantic relationships. <laughs> do you ever encounter families with intergenerational issues like this? And could genetics play a large role in such families? I have never been diagnosed with a condition, though, or I've never been diagnosed with a condition, though I have faced trauma. Do you think some people and families have issues so complex that it might be healthier to just live life the way it is now instead of seeking help? Wow, um, that's a lot, um, right? So there is not such a, there's no such thing as a gene for unlovability. <laughs> right. There's just there's just not. It doesn't it doesn't get passed down. There is, however, a cellular marker for unhealed generational trauma. Mm. Right. And and there are and those disappointments, there's uh, there are certainly markers for those pathological patterns that get passed down from generation to generation. And it sounds like that's what's going on here. Right. Um, and so what what I want this person to do is is to opt in on the idea that, you know what, I, I am lovable. Opt in on the idea that I can, I can show up and be the hero, right? Every family needs a hero. Every relationship needs a hero. It just takes somebody who's willing to go first. Yeah. And at this point, you're gonna have to go first and you're gonna have to be the one that says, it stops with me, mm -hmm. right? And then you gotta really sit and look and examine some of those things, right? Look at, look, Look at those pathological patterns that have gone on in the family for generations, right? And, and figure out what you've learned from that, right? Is, is it a lack of a functional model of how this thing is actually supposed to go? Is it those narratives that you've got playing in your head, right? Those, those shame tapes that we all have playing in our head about why we're not good enough because of, well, you know, mom and dad mm, probably, probably works for me. Well, you know, uh, there, was, there was that one time back in college, probably all of those things. So look at those narratives that are playing in your head. You know, what are those stories you're telling yourself about why you're unlovable? Mm -hmm. right? what, what, 
what are what are those stories and how are those stories showing up in your life? Why do you think that who you are isn't enough to be consistently loved, right? It, it doesn't have anything to do with your father. It doesn't have anything to do with your mother. It's got to do with you now and, and, what, and what's in your head right now. So what I want you to do is rewrite the script. Mm. You're the main character in your own movie. You're the main character in your own story. So I want you to rewrite the script mm. and I want you to be the hero. And I want you, when those shame tapes start playing, I want you to not resist and not push against it. Let them play, right? And let them play all the way to the end. And once you play those tapes to the end, you will in fact see that at the end of that movie, you are not dead. You are still standing. You are still breathing. And you are still very, very, very quite lovable. All you've got to do is identify those things in you now, right? And so it's it's up to you to be the hero of your own story. You can, you can break this pattern, but it's got to be a very intentional thing, right? That's what it's got to do. Follow up question to that. And hi, Dr. Judy. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Um, if I'm rewriting my script, can I date while I rewrite or do I got to take a pause from dating while I rewrite? Oh, well, now listen, <laughs> depends on how fast you write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what if we're not writers? Then what do we do? Right? Some of us can write it while we, while we live it and some of us can't. Here's, here's what I would say. Um, uh, if there is some unhealed trauma there, I would take, I would press pause. If there are some wounds that need to heal, I would press pause. Mm. If there are some places that you have been unwilling to look at, then I would press pause and take a strong look at those places, right? Mm. What are the thing, what's the thing you're pretending not to know about yourself? If you can, if you can't name it, you can't tame it. So I need you to sit down and say it out loud when it comes to knock on your door, let it in, let it come for a visit. Don't let it spend the night, <laughs> but look at it and get comfortable with it, right? Because when you say yes to it, it comes to the front door. But as soon as you say yes, okay, that's a part, that's a part of my package. You automatically open up the back door and give that pain and that shame a place to leave, right? And so that's the thing you've got to do. Really well said. Dr. Ish, I am so amped you are back on Med Circle. <laughs> <laughs> You just speak to me in a way that I go, okay, I get this. I get this. Yep. Yep. Uh, Dr. Judy, of course, I'm glad you're back on Med Circle. Oh my gosh, one of my favorite people to see. Thank you for being here. Hey, Dr. Judy. Thank you so much. Hi, Kyle. Hey, Dr. Ish. Now, have y'all ever met or worked with each other? Oh. We have met. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. You're both nodding. Yes. Excellent. Yes. All right. So Med Circle did not bring this duo together, but at least we brought them <laughs> together today. Uh, Dr. Judy, we are taking questions from uh, live YouTube viewers and Med Circle members. I encourage everyone to keep the chat going. Of course, we will not get to everybody's question, but we'll do as many as we can. Mandy, let's see our first question for Dr. Judy Ho. Or I assume that's, oh, there it is, there it is. Med Circle member asked, Dr. Judy, I experienced, experienced anxiety a few years ago, but since I got COVID in October, 2020, my episodes are more often. I was medically diagnosed with moderate major depression and anxiety disorder a couple of months ago and have not been able to start a treatment without medication due to clinics having a wait list for new patients. I've tried listening to music, podcasts, relaxing at home, taking a walk at the park, but they don't seem to work. What are the best ways that, that help my emotions and mind be more relaxed when having a sudden episode? Great question. And I'm so sorry that it's been hard for you to get services. And I just wanted to remind everybody that because of COVID, of course, there has been a shortage with certain clinics and wait lists, but also online services have expanded a lot. So there's a lot of affordable options. There's multiple resources in terms of online treatments where you can do telehealth sessions. There are helplines that are free. And so definitely look for online telehealth um, services and also look for free resources like NAMI. Talk about NAMI a lot. It's a National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org. They have tons of free support groups, educational groups, and hopefully at least you can get into a community and start getting some support. Now, it sounds like you've been doing a lot of different types of relaxation exercises and you've been tapping into music. I mean, all of these things, of course, are very helpful for trying to jumpstart emotion regulation. 
But when you are in the middle of a fight or flight complex, it can be really hard to actually dig into those relaxation therapies or any kind of adjunctive treatments or any type of resources when you're just really amped up. And really the first step is just to slow everything down. I noticed that you said you have anxiety. So we're going to address that first. If you're starting to feel like a panic attack coming on or an anxiety episode coming on, the first thing to do is actually to settle your breathing. This is so important because you're signaling to your brain and your body that everything is okay. And it's okay to be in the rest and restoration system. It's okay to be in the relaxation system rather than this fight or flight where essentially everything is geared up. And so one of my favorite breathing exercises to teach people is box breathing. That's the really first thing you have to do before. You I was hoping you were going to bring it up too. <laughs> it's, it's the first exercise to do before you can even tap into things like listening to music and podcasts. Cause how can yeah. you feel now if you're in the middle of an anxiety episode? And so box breathing is very simply visually drawing a box with your fingers while you follow with your breath. And so if you draw up, you breathe in two, three, four, draw across, hold, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four. And then you repeat the process. After eight to 10 of those, there's no way that you can't actually relax just a little bit because that's automatic. You don't have to calm down your brain. When you do that, your body will tell your brain to calm down without you having to interfere with your thoughts and all of that. And so once you can actually slow your breathing, convince your body and mind that things are okay, that's when you do the next step. That's when you listen to music, listen to a podcast, do something relaxing. And I would suggest anything that can keep your mind in the present moment. It is so important to keep your mind in the present when you find that it's running away with anxiety or thoughts of depression or negative self-talk. And sometimes it's hard for people to keep their mind in the present moment when they're really anxious or when they're sad about a lot of different things that are going on. So a really quick tip is just to pick an object in the room and to narrate it and experience it with your five senses. So this is my little notebook. I have my notebook where I jot down all my thoughts. Sometimes it's my to-do list. I mean, I write all of my things in this little notebook. And so one really quick mindfulness exercise is just to look at this notebook and narrate the characteristics that you're seeing for about a minute. Like, okay, this notebook is about, I don't know, like, six ounces, it's gold, it has texture, right? You're really focusing in on an object in the environment in front of you because that way you externalize your thought patterns and you interject whatever negative thinking or anxiety thoughts that are percolating in there. And so these types of things will help you very much in the moment to try to stabilize and emotionally regulate and then apply some of those more long range treatment techniques and resources that you'll learn in therapy and from med circle. Beautiful, beautiful. And I can attest to all of the suggestions Dr. Judy made. I only truly experienced anxiety last year. I, and I know that sounds, you know, almost unbelievable, but my whole life, you know, I rock depression. I got that down pat, but I never experienced anxiety until last year. And I, I'm with you. It is debilitating. So try what Dr. Judy said. I, I think you'll be very impressed with the results. Let's now go to a question for Dr. Ish Major. I also want to remind everyone that MedCircle is an education platform and we do not provide treatment or therapy in any way. This uh, live stream and our videos and live classes are for educational purposes only. This MedCircle member is asking Dr. Ish very recently came out of a long-term relationship with a person diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. What are some tools to cope with my um, resultant feelings of being lost, angry, and resentment, and having almost obsessive thoughts of my ex fiance. Wow, those uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of narcissistic uh, exes out there, and this this question is right in line with, uh, with what people are feeling. So I'm sorry you had to go through that. I'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry you had to deal with that. That's a very icky icky thing, and that's a really really tough place to be. But um, Here's what I, here's my advice to you now, right? I would advise you to stop dancing around the edge of your pain, right? I need you to pick that pain up and I need you to lead us directly to the main dance floor, right? Because we're going to figure out exactly what's happening now. 
your anger, your resentment, your loss, those are primary emotions, right? We have to learn how to feel those. Did, those did you emotions. say those are or are not primary they are not. emotions? They are, they are not. not. Right? We've, not. Got to, we've got to be taught how to feel resentment, right? They, okay. There are no oh, babies, yeah, yeah. right? There, there are no angry babies. <laughs> They're just not, right? Well, you know, I could argue on that one, but yeah, there's okay. Some, there's some colicky babies, but they're not born yeah. just angry, right? They've got something right. has to happen in order for, for us to feel those things. So I, wanted, I want you to get to the primary emotion over there. There are only four. Happy, sad, fear, surprise. So what are you feeling? Are you surprised by it? Probably because you didn't think it would happen right? Uh, did it scare you? Yeah, probably because it hurt. And now we don't think, you know, and now maybe we think that moving forward, I don't know if I can do this relationship thing well, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to show up and get the love I need, right? But the primary thing you're probably thinking is just sad. And so we need to, we need to deal with that. We need to process that part, right? And in order to process that part, We've got to stop fighting against the pain, which is I need you to say yes to the loss, say yes to the anger, say yes to the resentment. Stop asking yourself questions that help you feel bad, right? Stop asking yourself, why is it always me? Why do I always, why can't I pick the good one? Why do I always get left? Why does this always happen to me? Those questions help you feel horrible, right? I need you to ask some different questions, right? This is, this is a really cool time to get curious about yourself and flip the script on the questions you're asking, right? What is it about me that picked them? What is it about me that I feel might be missing? What is it about me that I feel like I'm trying to make whole when I'm picking my partners, right? Those are questions now that are gonna help you grow. Those are questions that are gonna help you move forward. Those are, gonna, those are questions that are gonna help you heal. The other questions, you ask a bad question, your brain's gonna give you a horrible answer. Why does this always happen to me? Well, because you're a loser. Well, because you're not pretty enough. Well, because you're not smart enough. And, and it goes on and on in perpetuity. And once that horse is out the gate, it's really hard to put it back in. So just ask yourself some better questions. Here's something I want you to do. Pretend like this question was coming from your best friend who you love with all your heart. How would you answer that question for her? Answer the, self, answer the question for yourself with that same level of kindness, with that same level of compassion, with that same level of consideration, with that same level of patience. Because once, once we get, once we brush up against those, against those narcissists, we lose the thing that they don't have, which is empathy. And we don't even show it to ourselves, right? And so be kind to yourself. This is, this is the time to be curious and to be kind to yourself and show yourself that kindness that you would show your best friend because this is hard, this isn't easy. And since we're talking about the narcissist, let's, let's go ahead and dive into what that means, right? It's, it's somebody who lacks the ability to care. They just don't have empathy, right? It, I, they, they didn't learn that part, right? Mom didn't pack that in the lunch box. It's just, they don't have it. There's a very grandiose sense of self. Um, they're preoccupied with these fantasies of themselves, of, of this unlimited type success, they feel like they only want to associate with other successful people. Uh, the word loser floats very easily off their lips, right? Because they're always categorizing you, either you're a winner, either you're a loser. There's a serious sense of entitlement. Uh, there's a need for excessive admiration. And oh, by the way, they don't mind using you to get what they want. <laughs> and so now there's, there's, there's many, many traits. Um, if somebody's got five or more, then classically, they'll, they'll be considered a narcissist. You make that diagnosis. We're not going to do that here. But everybody, every one of us has a mix of different personality traits. Sometimes we have so many of them that we actually classify that as a disorder, right? Narcissistic personality disorder. And so it's, it's fine for some people to have one or two or three, and it may help you function, right? A lot of narcissists are very, very successful in business and when it comes oh, to money and when it comes to achievements and, you know, ticking off the, the list of things that people can see and admire, uh, but where they usually fall short is when it comes to making the human connection, the mm -hmm. you and me of it all. And that's where you come up kind of feeling empty. And so just understand that you are not responsible to fix problems that are not yours to fix. His okay. narcissism is his problem. That's his mountain. Yeah. That's his hill to climb. Yeah. You can't fix it for him. Right. So narcissists, one of the things they will classically do. And uh, Dr. Drew, you, you know this. 
they will love bomb you when they first mm-hmm. meet you, right? And it is all about you and it is all about the attention. I'm going to buy you the gifts and I'm going to show you the good time and I'm going to make you feel like you're the most special person in the world. So keep that feeling. That felt great, right? Keep that blessing, but learn the lesson, which is, hmm, there may be something in me that was really attracted to the wrong parts of him. And that helped burn mm-hmm. me. Um, and I'm going to sit and I'm going to spend some time with those parts of me to flesh them out a little more. That is very, very well said. No question Med Circle has, I mean, a, a complete library on the topic of narcissism. Yeah. And Perfect. it it was my, that was my entryway into that world of education. And at first I thought, I don't need this education. I don't know any narcissists. And if I do, out. Well, here's, here's the real, you know, surprise of it all. I do know narcissists. Yep. They were, they were good at their job of being a narcissist. They, they tricked me. I didn't yep. know. And what the education did was then I was able to see the sign sooner and keep my boundaries healthier because of it. Um, I think everybody watching this without exception uh, peaks a little bit when the topic of narcissism comes out because not all of us have a direct connection with bipolar disorder, for example, but all of us have been affected by somebody who does not show empathy, who thinks they're on top of the planet and who belittles you and makes you feel like you're not. Um, And to get educated on those types of patterns, I think is the first step of feeling empowered. And thank you for sharing that deep insight. I can't see the YouTube chat, but I bet it's going off right now. Uh, Let's go to our next question with uh, Dr. Judy. This Med Circle member is asking Dr. Judy, how do you differentiate between someone who has uncommon personality traits and someone with a personality disorder? Have you ever come across a patient who you weren't quite able to categorize into the 10 specific types of personality disorders? Love this question. Yeah, great question, Kyle. And, you know, personality disorder diagnoses, much like clinical disorder diagnoses, are sort of a blend between science and art. You know, you read these traits and symptoms and you have two different clinicians and they might apply it differently or two clinicians ask different questions of the person and they get different history. And in one case, somebody gets diagnosed in another case that they don't. Here's what we know generally about personality disorders. There are generally personality patterns that have been pervasive for a very long time. So we're not talking about when the person is experiencing a really difficult time in their life. They have untreated PTSD, untreated depression. And for that period of their life, they're being difficult that's not a personality disorder by itself. This is somebody who by their early adulthood, they have essentially developed a set of ways to view the world, to treat other people and to navigate through their social sphere. And it's kind of fixed and rigid across different domains. So they may have these traits show up at work, at home with family members, with romantic partners and with their friends. If somebody is only difficult at work, that's not generally a personality disorder. So it kind of has to be across settings and across time. Personality disorder diagnoses has always been a point of contention among psychiatrists, psychologists, and everybody who uses the DSM because some of it feels like it's up for interpretation. And then, of course, as we know, you Google borderline personality disorder as an example. Oh, goodness. And it's like, you think, and you think everybody's got it and your mom's got it. Your partner's got it. Your best friend's got it. Your professor has it. And people have these terrible non-scientific self-tests that they can take on Google. And all of a sudden you think that you know something about personality disorders. And I want to caution people about this because a really good clinician would never diagnose a personality disorder after meeting somebody for 20 minutes. You just wouldn't know them well enough. You might have a couple red flags. You might be thinking about some things, but you wouldn't say this is a definitive diagnosis because you got to get to know them better as well and experience them as a person. And so when you see somebody who has what we call uncommon personality traits, according to this viewer, it could just be traits that feel difficult, traits that feel foreign, traits that get in the way of them having good relationships or otherwise getting in the way of them living a good quality life or causes the people around them distress. That's a big part of personality disorders is that sometimes a person is oblivious. They're like, my life is great. I have an awesome personality. And everybody around them is saying, um, no, you don't. You make my life miserable. 
miserable every day. So that is an influence that sometimes people with true personality disorders will have on people. And sometimes you have traits, but you don't have the full diagnosis. For me, everything's on a spectrum and it's actually less important that they meet the actual bona fide diagnosis as we talked about. It's not like a one-to-one. -one. It's not like you take a blood test and you know you have diabetes. You know, it's it's more subtle than that. So my main thing about how we think about this person clinically is, is it getting in the way of their relationships, in the way of major domains? Is it making it harder for them to have relationships? So whether or not somebody has the traits or the actual diagnosis, it's really about how much impact it's having on the person's life. And multiple times, because of the way personality disorders are constructed, and as we talked about, it's the muddiest part of the DSM for most people. Many people look like they have five or six different personality disorders all bunched up together. And one of the most common ones is what we call cluster B traits. It kind of feels like both in research and clinically when people present to you that sometimes people will present and they'll have traits of borderline personality, narcissistic personality, histrionic personality, and antisocial personality. They may not be full diagnosis for any one of those, but they actually have the traits, a little bit of the sprinkling of all four of those. And all four of those are called cluster B personality disorders. And so I think sometimes you do see people like that. You oftentimes see people who are blends of things. And for me as a neuropsychologist, if I feel like one clinical condition really stands out and then one personality disorder really stands out, I will diagnose that one, but I will note the other traits. So for example, I might diagnose somebody with borderline personality disorder with narcissistic and dependent personality traits. That just means that those other traits are still really prominent and probably should be addressed in therapy because it's negatively impacting the person's life but I don't believe that they actually meet the criteria. So I hope that that's helpful. It's really a whole spattering of different types of things. And it's really not about this black and white line. The way that I think about it and how to help my patients and help their family members and friends is, is this negatively impacting this person's life? And if so, it's something that needs to be addressed and to be talked about gingerly because most people with personality disorders have less awareness of it, at least in the beginning and your approach to how you discuss it is a huge part of how we can get them to make positive change and have better lives and relationships. Yeah, excellent and well said. Thank you, Dr. Judy. Let's go right into our next question. This one will go to Dr. Ish Major. This person's asking, whenever confronted by a family member, my ex shuts down, goes silent, and ignores them. He literally won't communicate unless the conversation remains shallow and does not reflect badly on him. If you say anything that displeases him, he treats you as if you're insane or non-existent. Both my daughter and I have had nightmares in which he mocks us while we yell and cry for him to listen, but no sound comes out of our mouths. The nightmares leave us hoarse and profoundly disturbed the next day. Can you explain this crazy making behavior in terms of disordered personalities and offer some advice on how to deal with it. Yeah, I don't know if he's got a disordered personality. It just sounds like your ex has trouble accessing deep emotions and shame. Uh, and that's when he feels it, it paralyzes him, right? When people who don't have the panel confrontation well are confronted, they go into survival mode, fight, flight, or freeze. And it sounds like your ex freezes and then takes flight or leaves, right? So the first step to resolving any conflict well is being able to create a safe space to directly address the issue, right? This is, this is the thing that's happening. This is how it's helping me feel. What can we do to not have this happen, right? And then from there, you've got to do the very often overlooked part that comes to any successful conflict resolution, and that is you've got to listen. Huh. <laughs> right? You've got to listen. Because what he's doing, what, there, there are many different ways we handle conflict. One of the most common ways is just to avoid it, right? Is to what? Like, to avoid it. To avoid right? it. We, we avoid it. We hope it'll just dissipate. We hope it'll go away. It'll just kind of clear off with the fog and there's nothing we have to do. But that only allows us to start doing this thing with our emotions called stacking, right? So the one issue is at hand. We just avoid it. He shuts down. Nobody, nobody gets what they need or want. And then the next day comes or the next week comes and there's another issue we have with him. And now it's not just this one issue. It's this plus the thing last week, plus the thing last month, 
plus that time last year of my birthday, right? And so we've stacked those issues now. And so what could be a very small thing to resolve is now a very, very huge thing because it's not just the one thing that we're feeling emotional about, right? And so here's a strategy I would use with him, right? And, and this worked really, really well. It's just the direct, the direct approach is always the best approach. And so in that moment, right, he's afraid. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to engage. He doesn't, he's afraid of what it's going to help him feel. He's afraid of feeling attacked. He's afraid that whatever's happening may in fact be my fault. And so what you've got to do is you, you've got to make it super simple. And so in that moment, right, folks are saying this and, and asking him that, and, and he's feeling overwhelmed and he's, and he's starting to shut down. You go to him, you sit down, eye level, you make direct eye contact, you grab his hands, right? And you tell him, hey, this is, this is the issue. Well, I don't have a problem with you. I've got a problem with this thing that keeps happening, right? Not, it's not you. It's the behavior, mm -hmm. right? Love you, respect you, mm -hmm. want you to be a part of our lives, but we've got to address this behavior because when this happens, these are some of the, these are some of the things that we feel when, when that happens. And so I wonder what we can do, right? Same team, you and me, working this thing out. I wonder what we can do to address this behavior. And then as soon as we can do that, we can get back to the loving you part and the liking you part and to having you a part of what it is we're doing, right? Yeah. And I guarantee you're gonna see a whole different result because now he's gonna say, oh, it, it's not me. It's just the thing that keeps happening. Cool, I'm, I'm a part of the team. I'm, I'm willing to help you work on that, right? Just those subtle little shifts because when we feel attacked and unloved, we shut down and when we shut down, that shame takes over and we wanna hide it in the closet and we wanna jump in the closet and hide with it and we don't wanna come out until everybody's left the party. So you gotta, so right? So address the thing head on and let them know it's not you, it's the behavior. You're a part of the team. What, what can we do to win this battle? Okay. I believe in all of that. And I agree. I agree only from the testimonials I get in my inbox that say they, they implement something similar to what you just said. And they go, it, it changed everything. I communicate with my spouse in a way that I never thought was possible and we're doing it. But what about the extreme examples where you say, hey, sweetie, you know, I'd love to have a conversation with you. First of all, I love you. And they go, oh God, what is this about? You love, okay, yeah, I love you too. What do you need? And then you go, whoa, you know, and then it just blows. They don't even get a chance to try what you tried because the first thing they said blew up in their face. Mm -hmm. You know, sweetie, I notice you do that a lot when I want to have a hard conversation. And I wonder, I wonder if you feel like I'm about to attack you. I like that question. Right, the direct approach is the best approach. I wonder if you feel like I'm about to blame you for something. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you feel like I'm not loving you as much as I'm supposed to be because of this thing we need to talk about. Right? Mm -hmm. Let's talk, just talk, talk about how it's helping them feel. Right, before we get to the issue, I, I've noticed that, I've noticed you do that a lot. And I don't, I don't wanna make you feel that way. So what, yeah. what, can, what can we do before we have some of these hard conversations because this won't be the last one. So I wonder what can we do to help both of us feel less attacked in that situation, yeah. if that's what you're feeling. Yeah, that, hey, that, that's good. And what I really applaud or what I really love about you demonstrating this is you do it in such a calm, effective way as though this is not your first time giving this example, which means you yeah. practiced this before. And yeah. I think one mistake people make is they get some insight like this or some knowledge like this and they go, that's great. I'm going to do that. And I go, don't have your practice round be the first time, you know, face to face. You got to practice that in your car or with a right. friend or something. You know, I've right. role played with my therapist before right. I've gone home to my partner and had that conversation because I'm yes. like, I need to be ready, you know? Yes. Yes. Great, great advice. And let me piggyback on that and say, not only practice with someone, practice in the mirror because the cues that they're getting from you or how your face looks. So you got to fix your face before you have that conversation, <laughs> okay? Hey, that's a blog post right there. Fix your face, Dr. Fix your face and watch your tone because those are the two things. They can't hear your words if they can't see past your face and your tone. So get those two things right first, practice, and then let the words spew forth, <laughs> okay? 
<laughs> oh, I love it. Hey, fix your face, practice, and see the results. Uh, wonderful. Uh, my favorite part thus far. Dr. Judy, are you ready for a Med Circle member question? Absolutely. She's nodding her head yes. All right, let's go into it, Mandy. This Med Circle member is asking Dr. Judy, can someone in their 30s or even 20s experience symptoms that indicate the future onset of dementia or Alzheimer's? What can a young adult do if they start experiencing memory loss? Certainly Dr. Judy is the best person to answer this question that I know. Great question. Well, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia and it affects your memory, your thinking, your behaviors and your mood. And over time, it progresses to the point where it really significantly affects daily activities and functions, but sometimes it takes a really long time before it gets there. And while Alzheimer's disease most commonly affects older adults, it can also affect people in their 30s or 40s. And when Alzheimer's disease occurs in someone under the age of 65, it's known as early onset or younger onset Alzheimer's disease. Now keep in mind, it's a very tiny number of people that have Alzheimer's that have the early onset form. So if you're having some type of cognitive issues, like you feel like your attention is waning or you're not remembering things quite as much, it may not be Alzheimer's, it may be something else. Now, some people don't realize that when you're depressed and anxious, it can actually affect your attention and memory. So people think that they're having dementia, but actually it's related to their untreated mental health symptoms. Sometimes you can have attention and memory issues because of untreated trauma. We know that PTSD actually alters structures and functions of the brain where memory is stored to a certain degree. And when people are treated for that trauma, their attention and memory improves. Sometimes you have attention and memory problems because you might have a subclinical or undiagnosed ADHD type of a condition. And other times, if you've utilized recreational drugs or drank a little too much alcohol, it can affect your problem solving skills. And most of the times when people go abstinent, they do recover most of those skills over time, especially if they do some things to bolster their own functioning. If we're thinking about true Alzheimer's, first of all, to really understand what's truly going on, you need to make an appointment with a neuropsychologist, somebody like myself, who actually does specialty work in understanding brain and behavior and diagnosing all different types of cognitive function conditions. And also you probably wanna see a neurologist. Sometimes imaging studies and other neurological exams can really help as well, narrow down what this actually is. But the things that tend to cause early onset Alzheimer's, we don't really all agree on what triggers the start of Alzheimer's disease, but we do understand that when people have Alzheimer's disease, there's fragments of a protein called beta amyloid. It builds up in your brain and they're called plaques. These plaques and these tangles in your brain over time start to block the ability for your brain cells to communicate with each other. And that's what causes some of your cognitive issues. So the risks for early Alzheimer's disease, really the family history is a big part. So if you have somebody in your family with Alzheimer's, especially somebody in your immediate family, like parents and siblings, that's something that you definitely wanna make sure to tell your doctor or psychologist. And generally what we see if it's actual Alzheimer's is that memory is the most affected, that other things kind of stay intact, your language functions, um, your ability to solve visual spatial problems or find your way around, that doesn't really get affected until much later. So if you really feel like exclusively it's just your memory that's being impacted and mostly it's short-term memory that comes first, that might be a sign, but again, please do not diagnose yourself. Please see the right professionals to help you with this. In terms of the types of things that you can do to strengthen your cognitive functioning, what we know about the brain is that even when the brain has some type of diagnosis of dementia, it is still very plastic. There is a lot that you can do to help yourself. And so really it's about training your brain, keeping it active and learning accommodations that will make your daily life easier. So in terms of brain training, it's very easy. It's literally things like doing puzzles, reading. Now it's harder when people find that they have cognitive problems, they kind of want to start avoiding all of that stuff. And you have to fight that. You have to train your brain so that it doesn't go away. It's just like training any muscle in your body. So you know, really push yourself to read and keep your brain active, do puzzles. Lumosity actually really helps in any of the other types of online uh, brain training games that actually does help to strengthen your brain. And then learning accommodations. What this means is that you're not necessarily training up new skills, but you're 
taking adaptations in your environment so that your life is a little easier. So if you feel like you're forgetting a lot of stuff, start carrying a notebook around and write everything down. Tell people about your appointments, ask them to remind you. These are the types of things that we call accommodations. And with a combination of both, you will see that even if you had some kind of cognitive dysfunction, you're gonna have some level of improvement or at least keeping things where they are for a longer period of time before they start to deteriorate if it truly is a dementing illness. And so those are just some tips, but again, please do not diagnose yourself. Please go see the appropriate professionals because there are so many other reasons that you might be experiencing some cognitive difficulties. And one thing that I didn't even mention is traumatic brain injury. You know, if you've recently mm -hmm. had a car accident or hit your head and had a major concussion, we find that people generally feel some level of cognitive dysfunction somewhere between right after the accident up to a year sometimes. And then your brain again starts to recover, but you can help speed up that recovery by doing training, seeing professionals and learning accommodations. Excellent. And Dr. Judy has a wonderful series on the different types of dementia at medcircle.com. And you have also have a great series on adult ADHD, Dr. Judy. And the reason I bring that up is because somebody in the chat said, hey, Kyle, can you please give a shout out to Dr. Judy for her videos on adult ADHD on my behalf? As a female university college student, your videos have helped me understand myself like never before. And I literally just got chills hearing that. And it, was, it has nothing to do with me, but it has to do with the impact you make on people, Dr. Judy, on people you may never meet. You may never hear about the impact you make, but you make it all that you make it every day. And that is an, an incredible uh, testimony. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Dr. Judy, for sharing your insight for all of our Med Circle members. Thank you so much. That was really kind. I really enjoyed filming that. You know, I think a lot of people have misconceptions about adult ADHD and we're glad oh. that we were able to do a series all about it. Yes. Now, Dr. Ish, don't think that I'm just here to compliment Dr. Judy because we've known each other longer. There is somebody <laughs> who, who said a very nice, wait, what are you going to say? Kyle, let me, let me tell you, I, let me compliment Dr. Judy because I watch her videos and I learn stuff. That's right. right. And, and, and let me also say, I hate lectures. <laughs> so for me to sit down and watch it, it's a big deal. So yeah, you know, it's, it's really, it's really good. Dr. Judy has a gift for taking very complicated, um, very complicated constructs and making them super simple. So a fifth grade of yeah. Aww. Dr. Dr. Well, Ish, you're, you're one of my favorite people. I'm so glad that we got to get together today, but yeah, yeah Kyle, we actually go way back. Dr. Ish and I have worked yeah. with each other on and off on the doctors for a couple of years. So yep. It's really lovely to see him. And he always has such great expertise to share. And Dr. Ish, you're the bomb. You're the bomb. Love it. So hey, awesome. I, I like to say that I doing. think the best, uh, <laughs> always end up at med circle. So it's no surprise it's that the two of you are here today. Yeah. It's true. Um, it, <laughs> And Dr. Ish, somebody said, I need Dr. Ish to follow me around every day, motivating, <laughs> inspiring me. That relationship advice is life changing. I have never thought about it that way before. And that last sentence, I've never thought about it that yep. way. Mm -hmm. yep. That is the moment, y'all. When you are watching a video with one of these doctors or attending a live class and they're giving you answers in real time like we're doing right now. Um, granted, there's a lot more people than we would have in an intimate uh, med circle live class mm -hmm. setting. But um, and you have that moment like, hmm, I never thought of it that way. Woo, you, be you better have every flag going. Well, pay attention yep. because that, that thought is the catalyst to some big life changes yep. and uh, really powerful stuff. So thank you both for being here and sharing um, uh, part of your day with us. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you. You're, you're very, very welcome. That's, that's what it's all about, right? It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just that one tiny shift in perspective that can take you from having a miserable day to a day that's actually okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, well, I know the two of you are very busy, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody watching. That is Dr. Ish Major, board certified psychiatrist, and Dr. Judy Ho, triple board certified forensic and neuropsychologist and part of the Med Circle Doctors. Thank you both. Love you, now, Dr. Ish. Are, love you, uh, Kyle. See you guys bye, later. Love you, Kyle. Love you, Kyle. <laughs> bye. See you guys. Oh, wow. They love me. That's so nice. Um, okay. So <laughs> next up, we are not quite done yet. We are going to have two more of the med circle doctors join us. You likely have seen them before. This is Dr. Dominic Sportelli, double board certified adolescent and child psychiatrist and clinical psychologist. I, I think once I called her the uh, matriarch of narcissism education or somewhat something like that. 
But here she is. Dr. Romani is also with us. Uh, thank you both for being here to uh, complete this second segment of this wonderful Q&A we're having with our members. So great to be back, Kyle. Always nice to see you. Looking good, buddy. Uh, thanks. All right. Well, I don't see Dr. Romani's camera yet, but I'm sure she'll uh, get it when we can. Dr. Dom, I would love to just get right in yeah. to our questions from all of the people tuning in to hear from you. So let's go to our first question for Dr. Dominic Sportelli. And thanks for staying up late for us, Dr. Dom. I know on the East Coast, it's much later. It is later, but I'm a night owl, so it's okay. Ah, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Med Circle member is asking Dr. Dom, what medications are available for PTSD and depression for someone who is very sensitive to the side effects of antidepressants? I already have a therapist and I go to the gym, but medications like duloxetine and sertraline give me nightmares, migraines, and make me tired. I find it so frustrating that everything has a side effect, Dr. Dom. Yeah, definitely pain with the side effects. I totally hear you. So a couple of things. Number one, I'm so, so, so happy that you're seeing a uh, psychologist, a therapist. Um, that would be my first suggestion for someone that's having difficulty with medications is make sure you're getting that baseline foundation with really good therapy. The other thing, and you guys know me by now, I'm all about diagnosis, right? So before you even think about a medication, you want to make sure that that diagnosis is solid. So confirm your diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder because, and again, I just, this is learning, right? Guys, I'm telling you, there are so many things that mimic PTSD. There are so many co-occurring co disorders, right? Other anxiety disorders, other panic disorders, other depressive disorders. There are medical circumstances that can mimic PTSD, guys. Don't forget that. And then we have to remember that substance use is very common with people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So people can self-medicate with substances, right? So we have to like roll all that stuff out, get a solid diagnosis. And now that we're working with a good diagnosis of PTSD, let's look at the medication algorithm because that's the basic question here, right? So first and foremost, the SSRIs, as you mentioned, you mentioned duloxetine, which is an SSNRI, that N is for norepinephrine, you probably know that. Um, but the SSRIs, Paxil, Prozac, Soloft, Celexa, Lexapro, I can go on and on, right? Probably one of those, maybe you tried, and you're having some side effects to that. But I want you to know something, that even though the SSRIs are sort of that foundational treatment, medication treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, there are many other medicines that could potentially help you. So the first thing that I would ask is, and remember, we have the diagnosis down, right? Diagnosis is down, co-occurring disorders are figured out and medical and substance stuff is out of the picture. My first question would be is, how is your sleep? Is your sleep disturbed? Now, people with post-traumatic stress tend to have really disturbed sleep. And that makes sense, guys. Think about that for a second. The foundation of post-traumatic stress is your body is hypervigilant. Your body and mind is hyper aroused all the time because you're in a state of protectiveness, right? You're not supposed to sleep when you're trying to protect yourself. If you fell asleep and there was a lion waiting in the bushes to eat you, you would not live very long, right? So, so you're not supposed to sleep when you're in a hyper aroused state. Unfortunately, your thermostat was reset. And I use that word thermostat, like your psychological and physiological thermostat was reset with this post-traumatic stress disorder because of this trauma that you experienced, right? So you're reset more sensitive, you're more hyper aroused and your sleep is probably disturbed. So again, getting back to that question, is your sleep disturbed? Now, if the answer is yes, then we say, okay, let's give you something to help you sleep, right? And that would be my medication recommendation. If it's trouble falling asleep, right? Like you just toss and turn and your mind is racing, then we have something called trazodone, which is an antidepressant that's a little bit sedating. It's not an SSRI, so it doesn't fall into that class. So you can get the antidepressant effects and you can also get that, that sleep initiation effect, which is really good. And it's not habit forming like Ambien and all those you know, sleep medicines that we hear bad things about. So that would be my first recommendation is look at your sleep, trouble falling asleep. Let's look at something like trazodone or ask your doc about trazodone. If you're having nightmares, if you can't sleep because you're having nightmares and because you're becoming hyper aroused because you're waking up in a state of sweat with heart racing, then we can help you sleep with something called prazosin. Prazosin 
is actually a medicine for high blood pressure. Uh, but what, but it, it's centrally acting and this, you know, it gets all physiology and, and biochemistry. But what I mean by centrally acting is it works on the central nervous system to just calm the central nervous system and thereby reducing blood pressure. But guess the crazy thing in science is we learn things as we go. And guess what we learned about Prazosin? It helps you sleep and it reduces nightmares. Go figure. So, so now that we know that Prazosin does that and you have a sleep disturbance, let's, let's work on that. So it's either gonna be Prazosin or Trazodone to help you get some rest. Now, hopefully getting some sleep and believe it or not, getting a good night's sleep can help you with some of those other symptoms that you may be dealing with, with post-traumatic stress. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Or just yeah. a better life at all. If you've not You're had not a good kidding. night of sleep oh in a while. God. Oh my God. So important. So incredibly important neurologically and emotionally and psychologically. So then, then the next step of my algorithm here, when it comes to medications for PTSD is we look, we talked about sleep and we talked about sleep medicines. So now I want to know, are you experiencing psychotic symptoms? Are you, are you experiencing, experiencing uh, avoidance? Are you experiencing um, that, that hyper, hyper, hyper arousal, arousal during the day? Mm -hmm. So the way that I would go about that is there's a medicine called Lamotrigine or Lamictal, which is another thing that we discovered secondhand, tends to help people with avoidance in post-traumatic stress disorder, right? But it's not an SSRI. So you might want to ask your doc, about lamotrigine, um, which is a mood stabilizer and an anticonvulsant. So that has been shown in the clinical trials to help with the avoidance behaviors. If there is a touch of psychosis going on with the post-traumatic stress, which can happen, and, and by psychosis, I mean like unrealistic, significantly unrealistic thinking, like even delusional thought content, paranoia, uh, hearing things, seeing things that aren't there, it can get to that level. And if it does get to that level, you can try what's called a second generation antipsychotic. And the recommendation would be something like Abilify, you may have heard these names, or Seroquel. So again, things to talk to your doc about that are not in SSRI. So you don't have to worry about the SSRI symptoms. Um, another one, and I'm saying a lot here, guys, so we got to take notes. If, if you have those hyper arousal symptoms during the day, and you don't want to go that Lamotrigine route, the other one is something called Clonidine. And guess what clonidine is? Clonidine is another anti-hypertensive medicine. So clonidine slows down your body. It slows down your heart rate. It slows down that, that heavy breathing. It slows down all those feelings inside that cascade, right? Like we talk about like anxiety being like a snowball. And a lot of times what happens is, is you have a thought. You might not even know what the thought is. All of a sudden your heart races. When your heart races, you, you put those together and you go, oh my God, my heart's racing. And then you can't catch your breath. And then you go, oh my God, I can't catch my breath. And guess what's happened to your anxiety? It's just boom, 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 boom. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's a medicine called clonidine that sort of blocks that, that, that uh, the heart rate and the heavy breathing and all that stuff to keep your body calm. And again, not an SSRI. And one more or two more I'll leave for you to discuss with your doc is, is one is called mirtazapine or Remeron. And that's an antidepressant, but not an SSRI that can be used for post-traumatic stress disorder. And the other one is Topamax. And Topamax is another medicine like Lamotrigine that was developed for seizure disorder, but also helps with mood regulation. And there have been a lot of trials, clinical trials, um, that uh, have shown positive effects with post-traumatic stress disorder. So you have mirtazapine, we have Topamax, clonidine, Trazodone, um, what else we talk about? Prazosin, right? So these are all meds to talk to your doc about if you cannot tolerate an SSRI. And, and by the way, that algorithm that I just discussed is actually a really cool algorithm that came from a multi-year study at Harvard South Shore that um, they looked at a meta-analysis of a ton and ton, a ton of journal articles and to look at what was effective and what wasn't. So um, some really good stuff. So you might want to check that out as well. Bab Elis. Thank you, Dr. Dom. And welcome, Dr. Romani. Nice to see Hi, you. Nice to see you too. And I so enjoyed listening to <laughs> Dr. Dom. It was really, it's, it's so, um, I, I have a lot of clients I work with that are on some of these meds, but it's really interesting to hear the state of the science where uh, psychopharmacology and, and post-traumatic stress disorder are coming. So thank you, Dr. Dom, for always being oh a master. Goodness, you're so welcome. You're incredible. I'm humbled and honored. 
Thank you. Uh, everyone's just so lovely here, aren't they, y'all? <laughs> everyone's so nice. Now, uh, Dr. Romani, how are you today? I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'm uh, thrilled you're here. I'm sure everyone is. And if you're ready, I'd love to go to your first question. I love that. Yeah. All right. Let's go. This Med Circle member is asking clinical psychologist Dr. Romani. Oh, uh, it's about a narcissist. What would you, I can't imagine. Okay, so if your narcissistic parent asks you why you are not open or communicative with them, how should you respond? My mom asks questions like this, but has history of lashing out when confronted with the truth. Okay, so this is a tough one because it's as though a trap is being set. Okay, I'm going to call that one honestly. It's a phenomenon we often see in these kinds of challenging narcissistic relationships called baiting. There's no answer you can give here because if you gave the honest answer, I'm not open and communicative with you because I feel as though you're contemptuous, you're dismissive, you're manipulative. It's not worth, you're going to actually need some of Dr. Dom's PTSD medications there <laughs> because it is just such an explosive rage. And what we teach clients who are, who are attempting to interact with somebody who has this kind of difficult narcissistic personality style is to really, really, you know, avoid over engaging and keep things kind of slim and trim. But what that does is in some ways, and listen, no one who's narcissistic is ever going to come out and say, I'm trying to bait you and you're not taking the bait. Hello. So they're not going to do that. So I would say, don't take the bait and hold your ground. Now, sometimes I'll say to people, it comes down to how much time this person has to have contact with their parent. They talk to them every day. Some of the things I'm going to share may not work as well. Because sometimes a person can say, you know, I'm in more of a listening mood than a talking mood today. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what's going on with you? You can say, oh, I've had a day. You know, I'm just, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of worn out. You almost need to keep a list of how you're going to go into kind of keeping it slim and trim. And usually, since a lot of people like to talk about themselves, you could probably get away with the whole, you know, I've, I've had a day. You know, just why don't you tell me what's new with you? The challenge is, is that because in many narcissistic relationships, it's about drawing you into the conflict. The conflict becomes sort of the fuel of the relationship. It's a very subtle dynamic whereby people with these personality styles almost hold superiority and dominance by staying cool headed during conflict, right? So they get someone all frothed up and say, my, oh my, is somebody getting a little bit? And you're like, oh, I was so calm a minute ago. And so what you don't want to fall into that. So it's really about recognizing a trap has been set. You're like a really clever rat kind of walking around the trap and figuring out how to get the cheese out without getting snapped. And it, but it's exhausting. I mean, at the end of the day, anytime I give this guidance to people, in essence, what I'm kind of guiding them to do is be somewhat inauthentic, which actually really takes a toll on us psychologically. And I think in this person's question, it's particularly compelling because this is a situation where it's their parent. And that means that not only has this person been dealing with this in their adulthood, they dealt with it for their entire childhood. So in that way, it can be very trigger triggering, very reactivating, and it can also bring up a lot of feelings of grief. So I'd say, remember what I've said in prior med circle presentations, deep, don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, don't personalize. That deep technique can carry you. Throw in there realistic expectations, radical acceptance and boundaries, and you've got the seven tools you need for this one. It is a hard way to live, though. So even as I say this, I'm not saying this is easy to do, and it's really important that outside of this relationship with your parent, you cultivate healthy social support networks so you have those spaces in your life that are characterized by respect, reciprocity, kindness, compassion, empathy, all the good stuff in the relationship. Beautiful. I love your combination of offering incredible insight and actionable steps along with validating the experience and understanding that this is hard. This is difficult. Even with everything, this is difficult. Thank you, Dr. Romani. Um, let's continue. I want to get as many questions as we can before our time is up here. So let's go to our next question. This one is for Dr. Dom. This Med Circle member is asking, Dr. Dom, is it possible that you can get hallucinations and delusions purely from trauma as a survival mechanism that your brain wants to flee from the cruel reality? 
And yes, the answer, the short answer to that is absolutely positively yes. And, you know, in the first question, we were talking about trauma and and medications for trauma, post-traumatic stress. And, and some of those medications are actually the antipsychotics because we do see some psychotic symptoms present themselves. Now, you know, and again, I'm going to, I'm just going to keep saying it because I just like, you know me, I, you know, make sure the diagnosis is correct, right? So there is trauma, right? Is it post-traumatic stress, right? Um, because don't forget that sometimes trauma can bring out a primary psychosis. Sometimes trauma can bring out a schizophrenic break, right? Or a schizoaffective break, um, especially in that younger population in their 18, 19, 20s, early 20s, right? So, so let's figure out what the diagnosis is. is. Is the psychosis a part of some primary psychotic phenomenon that that trauma sort of triggered, right? When we talk about that two hit hypothesis, when it comes to psychosis or schizophrenia, we talk about the genetic loading, the environmental loading, and then also that trigger, triggering event. And sometimes that triggering event can be trauma, right? Hmm. Um, so, so let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about psychosis in general, just to get a better understanding of it and its associations with trauma. When anytime someone talks to me about psychosis and says, hey doc, you know, um, I'm experiencing this symptom. I, I put it into one of two categories with regard to psychosis, the positive symptoms and the negative symptoms of psychosis. And the positive symptoms, not meaning good, but meaning additional, like adding something that wasn't there, um, meaning delusions, hallucinations, um, that sort of thing, right? Where you're actually experiencing perceptual disturbance, right? Hearing voices, something like that. And then you have the negative symptoms of psychosis, which is that isolative affect where they become very, very withdrawn and stop communicating and become very internal, very internally preoccupied, stop caring for themselves like uh, activities of daily living. So when you're speaking of psychosis and trauma, yes, you can have both of those, right? Now, Specifically, though, what I see with regard to trauma is psychosis that sort of is congruent with the trauma. And, and what I mean by that is flashbacks, right? So, so the people experience hallucinations or relive the experience of the trauma. Like, you know, they'll be sitting in a room with you or in a car or on the couch and they are brought right back to that point where they experience the trauma. They will smell it. They will yeah. see it, they will feel it, you know, their body will feel the pain or, or the anguish, right? So that's tactile hallucinations, that's dissociation, it's depersonalization, it's, it really is a form of, of, of a brief psychosis, right? So flashbacks and hallucinations of the trauma. The other thing that we see in trauma is something called dissociation, depersonalization and derealization. Those are kind of three sort of similar things and people get very, very scared when they experience this. Um, dissociation, dissociation, the first one I mentioned, just kind of means you're not really present. You're just sort of, you know, dissociation, a good example is, wow, I drove to work today and I don't remember my drive. Like, <laughs> holy cow, did that ever happen? Like, that's actually dissociation. You kind of dissociated probably because you're just so used to the drive. I'm using that as a simple example. But it's people can go through days and they're just like, I'm just like, like almost like a, like a robotic sort of... Um, affect in a presentation where you just dissociate from, from your uh, current awareness. Depersonalization is, is a meaning that people feel as though they're not real. So a, an example of depersonalization is I'm looking around and I feel like, you know, I'm outside of my body. Like I'm observing everything from afar. Like I'm not even present here. Like I'm, I'm some sort of outside observer looking down. That's depersonalization. And that can happen after trauma as well. And then you have another one called derealization where you're, you're living your life, but you look around and you just say, I, I just don't feel like life is real. Like this is like, like the Truman show, or this is like, mm. um, right. It's not real. Like this just yeah. isn't real. And I actually have patients that tell me that. And, it, and it's so it's so upsetting for me to hear because they're most of the time they're just afraid. They're, they're saying like, I don't like this feeling. Why do I feel like my life isn't real? Like it's it's frightening me. It scares me. And usually it's traced back to trauma. And, you know, it, it is. And, and Dr. Romney can certainly speak to this. 
at some point, um, I'm sure she's very knowledgeable. It's a coping strategy. It's a psychological coping strategy to spare yourself from the pain of life, basically. So your, your mind kind of just puts itself somewhere else, you know? So long-winded answer. I'm sorry about that, but I want to be thorough. Post-traumatic stress or trauma can certainly have psychotic-like symptoms. Those mm. are the ones that I see mostly when it comes to trauma. But again, make sure that it's not a primary psychosis as well. Sure. Thank you for that explanation. Let's go right into our next question for Dr. Romani. And Dr. Don, what are you drinking over there? Oh, that's a Gatorade. I'm so thirsty. Oh, I a Gatorade. On. Okay. I thought, I thought maybe, I don't know, he had a little something to drink. Okay. <laughs> next, we'll remember asking uh, Dr. Romani, my friend exhibits traits of borderline personality disorder, like excessive fear of abandonment, dramatic mood shifts, unpredictable behavior, paranoid ideation, et cetera. I feel that she is reluctant to go to therapy and find better coping mechanisms because all her life she has kept those around her from leaving by acting out with self damaging behavior. I have been attempting to encourage her to see a professional for about a year. And even though I do not think she wants to die, I'm worried that she may go too far when trying to keep people from leaving her. How can I go forward with this? How can I be a good friend? Is there a better way to get her into therapy? How do I navigate all of her unstable relationships? Lots to unpack here, Dr. Romney. There is, and I'm actually gonna start in a direction you wouldn't think. I'm actually not gonna focus myself so much on her friend who has borderline personality, and I'm gonna focus on the person who wrote this question. Yeah. Because that's really where the focus lies. Awesome. Which is, as, as an adult, we cannot take responsibility for another adult. And while we may feel as though we want to be there for someone we care about and we want to keep them out of harm's way, we at some point have to get acquainted with the limitations there. Even we as mental health practitioners have limitations on how much we can sort of force the hand of treatment. And the laws in the United States and the various states and jurisdictions are such that there are limits to the degree to which we can compel someone into treatment. And so unless a person is in a danger to themselves, danger to others or grave disability, we cannot mandate treatment. And even then it's really sort of a short-term hospitalization to get them to safety. But after that, them going into treatment remains a voluntary decision. But what concerns me is how much that the person who wrote this question is concerned about how do I navigate the unstable relationship? How do I get them into therapy? All you can do is be there in a way that has appropriate boundaries and is safe and good for you, encourage it. And then there's a point at which you need to step back. I think one thing that has to happen is if a person is testing the limits, I'm going to harm myself. If this happens, I might end up having to take my life. You do need to take them to emergency services. It cannot be a diffuse threat. Like we're going to have to take you to, no, you're going to take them. That sometimes speaks something loudly to say, this isn't working to get our attention. We're getting you to the emergency services that you need. I have to say, Kyle and, and, and Dom, you've probably seen this yourself in the last year. With COVID, one thing that got really strangulated in the system was emergency services. So whereas there was a time a person would say someone was very agitated and a danger to themselves, in this last year, year and a half, an emergency room no longer became a viable alternative because the emergency rooms were overrun and they were in their own, in their fashion, unsafe spaces because of infection. Mercifully, at least in much of the United States, we're coming out of this now. But many times I will work with clients who will either have a family member or a friend who really is saying, I'm out of control. I don't know what I'm going to do to myself. And I say, you very calmly say, okay, we're going to get in the car now and I'm going to be driving you to the emergency room where you're gonna have the opportunity to talk to someone. And they'll say, no, 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 I didn't yep. mean that. Now, it may, one might argue, well, that feels a little manipulative too. I don't think it's manipulative at all. I think it's honest. Because the fact of the matter is, is if somebody's your friend, I don't care if you're a licensed mental health practitioner, you can't be their therapist. I am not my friend's therapist. Right. I am not my family's therapist. I am their family member or friend. Right. So if they really were getting to the point of dangerousness, I wouldn't roll up my sleeve and attempt to make it better. I'd say, it's time to get you to emergency services. I can drive you. I can call emergency services to get you. But this is not something we can handle right now this way. And so, but my bigger concern for the person writing the letter writer is they've gotten so deep into something 
that they, they're probably no longer taking good mental health care of themselves. It's really crucial for the person who wrote this question to be in their own therapy, to really be, you know, to getting to the core of why do they feel so responsible for this person? What core wounds are getting activated for them? There may have been a sense of helplessness they had about a prior relationship in their life, wanting to help a parent or another family member. This may be a role they take in multiple relationships, but there's a point at which, and unfortunately, borderline personality, like a lot of personality disorders, where you have to recognize the limitations of the situation. And if somebody is making self-harming or suicidal threats, you bring in the professionals and that that suicidal threat is no longer a way to activate people to communicate and help them, but rather it becomes a call to, we need to get the, the appropriate medical and psychiatric services here. And to the degree that's becoming a problematic interpersonal dynamic, it may sort of then the person says, okay, this is not getting me to where I wanted to. Hopefully it's getting them maybe to the care they need. But this, I, you know, the ultimately you can model being in therapy. You can say, hey, I'm in therapy. I like being in therapy. It's helping me sometimes when people see that I, I'm very, open. I talk very openly about being in therapy for no other reason. I want people to know it's honestly the best part of my week. You know, it is, it's important. It is orienting for me. There is, I work with people in this realm. I have to take care of me. And I have absolutely no shame. I will say it to any group of people why this is so important to me. And so we've got to say, I tell people, yeah, I'm in therapy. You want me to walk you through that? I mean, obviously they'll come to me because I'm a, I'm a shrink, but I think to the degree that this person might say, you know, I'm in therapy. This is really helpful. It's the only way I can deal with stressors. And it's really the only way to move forward at this point. I'm doing it. I can help you. I can drive you to the waiting room, but at some point or help you, I can give you some names, but there's a point at which you got to say, uncle, and just pull back. I want to ask a follow-up question. I'm actually embarrassed. I don't know the answer to this, but if, if someone's in a relationship and they approach their partner and say, I want to end this relationship. It's not working for me. We're breaking up. And they say, if you break up with me, I'm going to kill myself. Okay. This is a future thing. Now they're not going to do it. Now they go, if you make that choice, then tomorrow I'm going to kill myself. What is the response there? Is it the same? I would say it's the same. It's absolutely same. the same. Absolutely okay. the same. And say, in fact, the fact that you even said that right now, okay. I think it's actually imperative that, that we, we figure go. out an emergency psychiatric plan right now because uh, this is not working anymore. Uh, this is we are not growing together anymore. Yeah. And given that there is danger here, we are going to have to get these services. Now, if you bring someone to emergency services and they say, I'm fine, this is a fight gone wrong. Um, Sometimes the, 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 the clinic or the hospital will let them go and that becomes a revolving door. But there's a point at which we have to understand the limits that we can exert on another adult's life. That's what yeah. boundaries are about. Yeah. And it is painful, Kyle, and it is difficult. And people will say, I feel so guilty. The main emotion that gets evoked is guilt. But then you have to ask yourself, at what point are you sacrificing your life in the name of trying to be there for someone else to where you're not living your life at all anymore. Right, right. right. Uh, Dr. Dom, I saw you intently listening and you work in an emergency room. You see this. Is there anything that you've seen or heard from Dr. Romani that you would like to uh, add on to? Oh my God, I wanna emphasize every single thing that she's saying because yeah. I, I work in a psychiatric ER, as you said. So that's exactly who we see. We see people that come in from the simple, I told my boyfriend I was gonna kill myself and, and he called the police on me to someone that is really having a, a significant crisis and their family brings them in or someone called 911, they do a welfare check and the police say, look, we feel really uncomfortable leaving you. We want you to just get checked out by the docs at the hospital. Um, the important thing is this, right? You know, I'm, I'm a trained medical doctor, but my specialty is psychiatry. So my heart attack is that suicidal patient, meaning this, if someone says to a loved one, if let's just say one of your friends, Kyle, said to you, I'm having chest pain right now and I can't breathe. Are you gonna be like, okay, let's, uh, all right, let's check your blood pressure. Let's make sure that your heart rate's good. Let's check your oxygen saturation. No, you're gonna go, let's go, let's go, let's go to the hospital, please. Let's, let's go to the hospital and get checked out. 
If someone says they're suicidal, it's like saying, I'm having chest pain. I'm yeah. having signs of a stroke. I'm having, this is an emergency. Good, good way of putting it. Get yeah. checked. And listen, plenty of people with chest pain go to the hospital and the doc's like, hey, it's indigestion, go home. Yeah. Fine, good. Okay, yeah. good. You, you got checked out, now whatever. Yeah. Right. right. Or they go to the hospital and they say, look, you're not having a heart attack right now, but you do have some blockage. Let's get you set up with some services. Mm -hmm. So the same thing. It's like the same analogy. So yeah. I emphasize everything Dr. Romney said. And, and listen, guys, it's an emergency. You could call 911. You can yeah. you can call your local law enforcement and uh, it's an emergency. Get see yeah. some, go to the hospital. Uh, one of the first things I learned at Med Circle was that you are allowed and correct me if I misinterpreted this, doctors, but that you are allowed to ask the question, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? That is a, a question you are allowed to ask people. I think people get afraid to ask that to somebody if they're suspecting they're really struggling. And um, I remember speaking to Kevin Hines. He was on his way to the Golden Gate Bridge in an attempt to end his own life by jumping off. He made it all the way to the Golden Gate Bridge and he did jump off. Unfortunately, he is still here today as a mental health advocate and suicide prevention advocate. But he told me that on his way to that bridge, if somebody would have stopped him and said, are you okay? Because he was, I mean, he was a mess. And they said, are, are you doing okay? Are, are, do you need help? Are, are you thinking about hurting yourself? He would have said, I need help. I need help. And hopefully that person would help. And it was that one question that nobody asked that could have prevented a very big tragedy. Um, thank you for having this great conversation. Uh, let's go to a, another question from a Med Circle member. This one is going to both. All right. I have been married for 13 years. Every two to three years, my husband becomes depressed, cheats, leaves our home, and files for divorce. Marital counseling has helped in the past, but only for a little bit. A year ago, I discovered he was cheating again and drinking after 18 years of sobriety. Throughout all of his erratic behavior, he has kept his job and has consistently gained success and is now a CEO of a small tech company. He also has abandonment issues from childhood. My question is, could this be bipolar disorder, maybe cyclothymia, or perhaps intergenerational trauma playing itself out or could it be something more insidious? Dr. Don, why don't we start with you and then we'll have a follow up with Dr. Romney. All right, great. So, so we have some tidbits here. We have some clues to a lot of things that could be very, very, very expansive. And so, you know, the, the, the questioner completed the question by saying, could this be bi bipolar disorder? Sure, it could be. And that could be one of a hundred things or maybe more that this could potentially be. Um, bipolar disorder is very distinct. Right, bipolar disorder is a distinct time period of mania, right? Four to seven days of mania, expansive, elevated energy, impairing your life in a negative way as bipolar one and maybe bipolar two, not necessarily impairing, but having four days or so of those significant manic symptoms, right? Because this individual sounds like he still has success in his business and, and so forth. So maybe it's not impacting his life globally in that respect. Could it be bipolar disorder? Yes, it could be. But I'm, I'm also hearing so much other stuff. I'm hearing that really a good psychiatric or psychological evaluation would sort of uncover. I'm hearing depression, right? Now it sounds like the depression is cyclical every few years or so, but that doesn't mean it's bipolar disorder. People have unipolar depression, but recurrent, right? So periods of depressive disorder that can resolve and then sort of recur. If you don't have that manic component, then, you know, it's not bipolar disorder. It could be recurrent unipolar depression. Um, I'm hearing alcohol abuse in there, right? So it sounds like he relapsed, which is, a, is another can of worms there, looking at substance abuse and what's going on with regard to that. And if that's playing a role in it, because don't forget, you know, just because this individual was abusing alcohol and is maintaining alcohol sobriety doesn't mean that he's not using other addictive things to sort of, you know, not deal with his own personal issues, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's gambling, maybe it's prostitutes, maybe mm -hmm. it's spending, now who knows, right? Um, some sort of hedonic thing that, that he may be doing. I'm hearing infidelity, right? I'm hearing abandonment issues as a child. Um, so, so I think the important thing here is yes, it could, be, it could be bipolar disorder, but I think it could be a lot of other things and it really needs to be looked at professionally. Um, the unstable relationships, the abandonment, the identity issues, the maybe impulsivity, 
and this is like a great segue to Dr. Romney, right? Because now we're, we're sort of like thinking a personality disorder. This could just be like a cluster B kind of personality thing going on that's making his life so challenging and your life. Well, so and, challenging and I mean, we're, we'll, we'll never know. I mean, right. what it is, but for, for this woman who's struggling, you know, to, to have this healthy relationship with her husband, what would your insight be for her or potential next steps for her either to help her husband or herself or both? Yeah, I think, listen, you know, depending on how the relationship is going, truly having a conversation about the marriage, it sounds like they went to marital therapy at some point. And I think that would be a great venue to bring up, you know, maybe we should split and do some individual assessments, right? And and maybe take a look at some of the things that you're dealing with individually, right? And look, e even she's dealing with some challenging things. And as Dr. Romani said before, therapy is the greatest thing in the world for everybody, and especially somebody in a challenging marriage, independently. So not only should she potentially see someone to talk to and, and gain some insight into herself and coping strategies and skills, but, but her husband should as well. And that might lead him down that pathway of maybe gaining some insight into a psychopathology that could be treatable, right? And I know the personality disorders are down that kind of windy, mountainous, spiky pathway of difficulty and, and challenge with treatment um, and very vague. But if it is a bipolar disorder, then yeah, it's treatable. If it, if it is an acute depressive syndrome that's happening from time to time, yes, it's treatable. If it's, if it's a substance dependence issue, totally treatable, right? So that's what we wanna do. I mean, I'm not saying that the, the personality disorders are not treatable, of course they are. Sure, but, sure. You know, but yeah. There certainly is hope here. Dr. Romney, what's your response? So I'd say for, you know, when we see a question like this, Right now, what she's trying to do, I mean, Dom did a phenomenal job of laying out all the potential diagnostic hypotheses. But before, you know, and, and I'm so glad he did that because if let's say Dom and I were in a room together with, with, this, with this lady and Dom did a great job of laying out all of what he thinks could be happening. My next step would then be to say, and does it matter? Oh, because then you've got to ask yourself, <laughs> given what you've gone through in this marriage, the more people try to find these explanations, now you've been hurt. What, what, you know, are you going to be able to unsee this? You know, what explanation here can make it okay? And we know that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And he has been at this rodeo before with the infidelity and the lying and all of that. So the human heart has a capacity for hurt, especially at the hands of one person. And that's why I echo Dr. Dom's sentiment for her to be in her own work to understand her own cycle of going back into a situation where she, her trust is being betrayed on a regular basis. Because the fact of the matter is, is that there is a point in this where all the hypotheses can be on point, et cetera, et cetera. But then people often look to these, they pin a lot of hope on these diagnostic hypotheses. And then if I have that puzzle piece, I can make this work. Yeah. Now you just may know what's happening. And if this person continues behaving the same way, so now you know, I have a husband and he has depression and he cheats on me and he drinks a lot. That's her call to make. But yeah. you know, we have to yeah. be very careful not to get that thing that we just sort of hang our hopes on like, oh, now I got a diagnosis. It's not gonna make it better in most cases. It's maybe now that you have a framework to understand the behavior, but the behavior is gonna sustain. And if the behavior is going to sustain, and a lot of these behaviors tend to be very, very difficult to change, like chronic infidelity, then ask yourself, if this is going to be the landscape, do I want to stay? Yeah, a tough question. Now, um, we have a little bit of time left, but I, I want to hear this answer. She want, Let's say th uh, this person wants to leave. They want to leave, but they feel so bad leaving somebody who's struggling. And they're not leaving somebody, they're leaving the father of their children, their confidant for the last two decades. I'm making this up. I have no idea who this person is. But there are people like out, out there like that. So for the, for the person who says, I, I know I got to leave, but Dr. Romani, I can't. This is, this is the person that I said I was going to be there for. What's your response? Then have realistic expectations of what you're getting into, Okay. There are no martyr, martyrs amongst us, right? You're just, it's just going to be you having to have realistic expectations. Because remember, 
it's very it's a very very tricky precedent to stay in a relationship on the base of a future promise i'm going to change i'm going to get better i'm going to get it together that is not the reason to stay that's the reason good. to stay is if you have this commitment to this larger purpose and if you know what i hate to say it it could very well be that your spouse finally gets their house in order and then they're going to leave so do not hinge your hopes in that way. This feels like the right thing for you to do, that the person you are wants to stay, then you've got to find a way to stay without expectation and without agenda. Because the minute you link it to that, inevitably, it's going to be a whole host of disappointment and all the negative moods that go through that. So it's really, really about having that big conversation with yourself, because what people will sometimes do is the fear of leaving, the fear of the unknown, the fear of uncomfortable emotions like guilt. In a way, it's a bit of a cop out to stay because then you don't need to deal with all of those negative emotions. So it's like it's sort of the more heroic societal position. I'm the strong person who stayed with my yeah, mentor, yeah. partner or something like that. Great. Wonderful. Okay. But yeah. then make sure you have all of that straight in your mind because then you could spend another 10 years worrying about them. Y'all are just so good, man. I have the best job in the whole world. Okay. This person, Dr. Dom says, fantastic. Dr. Sportelli. It's nice to hear someone with expertise in different types of medications and a psychiatrist who cares to dive into specific symptoms and appropriate medication. That is from a viewer. And uh, Dr. Romani, somebody says, Dr. Romani, you're absolutely amazing. I appreciate your content so much and you tell it like it is. That she does. Uh, your Med Circle videos have changed my whole outlook and outcome for my family for my life. I get emails like this about y'all every single day. Remember, I used to forward them to you back in the day. I was like, look, someone said something nice about you. Well, I would just be sending emails to you all day if that was, uh, if I kept doing that. I thank you so much. You continue to collaborate with MedCircle, show up, create amazing content, answer these questions, attend live classes. Dr. Dom, it's 9.30, 10 o'clock where you are. I mean, you guys really deliver to our members and I am so thankful for that. Um, if you have not seen Dr. Dom and Dr. Romani on MedCircle, I know you've seen them on YouTube, make sure you subscribe right here. But if you've not seen them on MedCircle, now is the best time to do so. During Mental Health Month, anybody who wants to, you can sign up for free and get 30 days of our entire video library, all past live classes, any future live classes in the, in the 30 days uh, that you have, you can attend, get your questions answered. Um, you can do all of that now at watch.medcircle.com and you'll have uh, the rest of the month to sign up. Uh, but it, you, know, you sign up on May 31st, you get the whole next 30 days. So um, thank you um, for uh, considering uh, using MedCircle for your mental health education. And um, Dr. Romani and Dr. Dom, are there, in short, because at 6.30, and I want to get y'all out when we said we were going to get you out, but are there any final words that you have, especially since we're in Mental Health Month? Dr. Dom, we got 30 seconds. Why don't you go first? Um, listen, I, again, Kyle, I love being here. And, and again, and it's what Dr. Ish said before, it, this is what it's all about. This is why I did what I did. And, mm -hmm. and, and having MedCircle allowed me to do that. So I thank you. And I thank everyone else involved in MedCircle to allow me to have this platform, number one. And number two, as Dr. Romney was talking, I was saying, would it be like a conflict of interest or unethical if I went to her for therapy? What do you think? <laughs> you know what, Dom? Come out on to, come to LA. I will sit down. We'll have a cup of tea. So, wow, we'll she is so hey, if, good. Uh, if we can film it, I'll pay for everything because that would be great content. Dr. Dom in a therapy session with Dr. Romney. You know, I have gotten on camera therapy, kind of. I mean, it was mock therapy with Dr. Romney. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Romney, any final words, especially for Mental Health Month, for everyone listening? For Mental Health Month, I recognize that for many people, sometimes seeking out therapy is out of reach. It, it, it can be expensive, hard to find someone. But if you can find a way to give it a shot, and you know what? People who feel empowered and bold and safe enough to talk about it, if they're in spaces they can, please do. I think this is, you know, like Dom said, we're willing to talk about having heart attacks and other illnesses at the dinner table, but somehow we're still not to the point where we're willing to talk about having depression or be in therapy at the dinner table. Until therapy becomes the dinner table conversation, I am not going to give up this fight. I know Dom is not going to give up this fight. And I know MedCircle is not going to give up this fight. So keep it real, everyone. 
That's right. I'm on 20 milligrams of Paxil. And tonight I switch over to Prozac, everyone. And I have depression, baby. So there's me. Uh, thank you all. Thanks to our doctors. Thanks to our viewers and Bridget and Mandy behind the cameras making it all work. Remember, whatever you're going through, you got this. All right. Thanks, doctors. Thank Appreciate you. it. Bye, guys. Thanks. Love you Bye, all. Guys. Have a good, good one. Night. Take care. Bye-bye now.